Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 589 being recorded Thursday, June 4th, 2020. I'm Jim Tannis. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Sebastian Peak. I'm Brett Van Spruenberg. Every week with you guys. Come on, just... <laughs> Just get it no, down. I, I never know who's next. Like, are we going? It's yeah, just a, going, it's a random my screen. Is I'm going to wait for some next because it's it's clockwise the way. No, I'm I know, but I usually go last. So the the order of introduction has never correlated to the position on the screen. I mean, I used to. I, I guess, know it's it's Jim's first, and then from and when they were hired on Jim, the PC Pro. Jim, yeah, so Mary, Jeremy, myself, Jeremy, Sebastian. Hey, oh, okay. And, yeah, see, leave us a works. comment if you don't like the round robin style. If you want Jim to just introduce us, if you want us to introduce ourselves not by name but with some, you know, hilarious comment or something, let us know. That could work. There's no hilarious comments yep. coming out of us tonight. Well, hey everyone, uh, we're glad you could join us. If you're stumbling upon this, first of all, God help you. But second, uh, we are a tech podcast. We record a weekly show, usually Wednesdays or Thursday nights. We did a couple. We used to be Wednesdays always. And then we got away from that, and it's usually my fault. We did a couple Wednesdays in a row, but then again this week, uh, Jim couldn't make it again. So uh, we're back to Thursday, but we will have a show for you one week or the other, and you can uh, know and join us when we record these live by heading to pcpro.com slash subscribe, where you can join our mailing list. We send out an email a couple hours before we do a show. Uh, that way you'll know, if, you know what day of the week it's going to be and exactly where to go to get that live stream link. And then, of course, you can always watch our podcast on demand over at pcpro.com slash podcasts. We have a, a page for each episode. Uh, we have the embedded video player, the show topics we covered, and any uh, relevant links, our picks of the week, uh, links if you want to find one of us and yell at us. We've got our, our social media contacts there. And also, of course, uh, the direct, direct download to the audio and a link, an invite to our Discord. Uh, we have a Discord community uh, that's a, a great growing community over there. And uh, there's a link on every uh, podcast show note page to head over there. Uh, also, uh, we, if you want to support us here, we have our Patreon at patreon.com slash pcper. Uh, two quick things with Patreon this week. Uh, first, I missed a, uh, a, a note last week. Uh, so if you become a new patron or you increase your pledge and you want to send a note, you can uh, just send that to us after you make your pledge or change the name of your account before you make the pledge, whichever works for you. We had one come in last week, but last week was Jim's air conditioner didn't work. It still doesn't work, but it was much hotter last week, and uh, I just wasn't with it, and I forgot. I didn't see this come in, so my apologies. Uh, last week, Jim ba Jim Bastian, Jim Bastian, the Conqueror, uh, sent in a message, and he, his message was, Long live Cobol. So that must have been during one of our retro uh, talks. So uh, thank you, uh, Jim Bastian. I think he started as Sebastian the Conqueror and uh, transitioned. I don't know. Jim, Jim what, Bastian? What does that mean? Can I... Uh, never mind. We don't have to get. We don't have to go on that road. Just thank you. Just thank Is it like you. left and right or top and bottom? That's what I need to know. I, I'm thinking more top and bottom. Maybe front to back. Okay. Mm. Um, maybe flip it over. Mm. Whatever. There's, works. there's a lot going on there. It's a lot to unpack. And then the other quick update on Patreon is, I'm sure if, if you're if you're part of, if you've contributed to a Patreon campaign before, you've probably already heard Patreon is instituting sales tax collection in the United States. Now the way this is going to work, it starts July 1st. And it depends on where you are, the, the patron or the donor. Uh, it, it's your jurisdiction uh, will determine how this works. So because the U.S. Ta sales tax is all screwed up and every state has their own system, uh, some, some way or in some cases you won't have to pay tax and some you will. It also, from what they're telling us is the creators, they're saying that it depends on how we, we structure the rewards so if there's a physical reward, that'll certainly be taxed almost everywhere. There's a sales tax. If it's just a digital reward, that'll only be taxed in some states, not others. Uh, so we're going to, our Patreon campaign is long overdue for uh, an overhaul. So we're going to try to figure out a way to structure this. All of ours are spiritual awards. Well, except uh, for the dog hair. The dog hair wasn't a physical award. It was, that was. Uh, but Did we'll we ever get that? We, nobody ever, ever asked for that. I'm not sure anybody um, claimed it. But it was offered. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're, we're going to try to structure that in a way that minimizes, if possible, any any tax uh, obligations on you. And of course, if you, with all other Patreon changes, if you are offended by that and don't want to participate in that, of course, we understand. You know, th this is not a requirement. We are so thankful for all of your donations there. They do go directly to paying the server costs and helping us uh, do what we do here. It literally directly goes to funding the site. 
Uh, it's not going in anyone's pocket personally or anything. So we appreciate it. Uh, but if you can't do it for that or any other reason, uh, we of course understand. And we thank you for your yeah, past support. Maybe one of the, one of the things could be, uh, you know, for like five bucks, just not, I mean, a different offset type of, of donation that, uh, once a month, uh, hit Friday night and, uh, race with me. I'll host, um, uh, I'll host yeah. some dirt or grid or whatever. Yeah, well, Project we gotta, cars too. We're, we've got to look into that because we, we really do need to revamp all the tiers. So uh, they, they don't apply in some cases anymore, but monthly uh, racing with Josh will go by the cycle of the moon. There you go. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you're in Laramie, if you find yourself there, maybe Josh can recommend a burger, or maybe not a burger, but a burger-like meal. Uh, it's not Wednesday, but Josh did have his burger, his burger quote burger Wednesday yesterday. So, what'd you have, Josh? It was the uh, their version of Italian beef. So, Italian beef, I think, originally came from Chicago, and uh, it's a marinated roast beef type thing with all kinds of spices and juicy things and cheese and fantastic it tasted really well and it was um, you know on a toasted bun though i guess that the toasted buns are not usually done in chicago that they just have them untoasted and they're kind of wet but you know i i'm non-traditionalist i'll i'll take toasted but it was fantastic and that's i, uh, I don't think hours i think that. chicago yeah <laughs> right and uh, based on the wrapper in that photo, uh, was this at your favorite place, uh, Born in a Barn? Hey, on, born uh, in a Barn, yes. Yes, nice. That's, that's the place. All right. Clayton and Please Jeff. tell me that's just on the right side of the tracks. That is. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Union Pacific. All right. Well, hey, let's jump into the meat of the show. No Speaking of meat. Intended. Like, well, I, I, that could have been a good one. I blew it. All right. Well, Sebastian, uh, he wasn't here last Wait a minute. Week. You blew. You blew the meat. <laughs> oh, you did. It's not that kind transition. of show. Oh, actually, it oh, is that kind yes, of show. I'm sorry. It is. It is. No, it is. It is that kind of show. It is. Yes, we are nothing if not irreverent here. But uh, Sebastian, you were out last week, but you've had a. You've been busy. You've got a couple reviews uh, come in over the last two weeks. So we're going to start off with uh, an interesting little one with some great photography that you had for us here. Uh, tell us about this, this ECS Leva SF110 A320 mini, a- a- AMD powered mini PC. Yeah, ever since I started reviewing mini PCs years ago because no one else apparently wanted to. So Ryan sent one to me and then I think my first one was actually an ECS Leva, actually. I've done a number and it seemed every time a review went up, the first comment or one of the first two comments was always, yeah, but I'd really like one with an AMD APU, or I'm waiting for an AMD mini PC. I think an AMD APU-based system would be great for a home theater PC. Just all these requests for AMD-powered mini PCs, because it just makes sense. They're the the company who makes the APUs. They've, they have far better integrated graphics, at least traditionally. And we're finally, I finally got hands-on. This is the first one I've ever experienced. And it's an unusual form factor by mini PC standards. I mean, usually they're they're a little bit smaller than this or they're not this thin. This uses, they call it book size. And of course, books come in many different sizes, but it's think about like a, a paperback book. It's not a whole lot bigger than that. It's a little bit deeper than that, but the actual dimensions are, where do I have that here? It's, uh, it's only like 33 millimeters tall, I think. Yeah, it is, yeah, 33 millimeters tall, 176 deep and 205 millimeters wide so it's it's small and it's all metal except for the front which is plastic so the the slots in the front there's just a little section kind of off to the left over the usb ports that has an air intake and then the whole thing sides top bottom are all metal just steel so the only airflow is a little bit in the front and then there's a uh, exhaust in the back like a laptop style exhaust and it uses a laptop style blower fan inside so you are limited in what CPUs you can install in this. And unfortunately, that limit is 35 watts, which means uh, very few mainstream AMD CPUs with graphics are available that fit that. It's a subset of their, of their offering. You can't just go out and buy one of the APUs. They do make lower power variants of the APUs. They have for the last couple of generations at least, but... They're they're sold to integrators. They're, I've never seen one at retail. You can find them on eBay, but 
the 35 watt variants are not easy to get. So you're pretty much stuck with their Athlon series, like the 200 series and the 300 series. I used a 3000 G because that's what I have. 35 watt has Vega three graphics, two core, four thread part. And, you know, this thing has memory slots, laptop style memory slots. So you can put DDR4 up to 2666. It holds up to 32 gigabytes. A major drawback of this, unfortunately, is that it is an A320 board. So there's not really an upgrade path here to the next gen. I, there's no way A320 is going to support like the 4000 series APUs. So this is a, a Zen powered part. And I think that's pretty much the best you're going to be able to do. Uh, it does have NVMe support. It has a two and a half inch hard drive cage. You can put an SSD or a spinning hard drive in here. So storage isn't really an issue. It includes an Intel uh, wireless card in the kit. The kit retails, uh, if you could find it anywhere, apparently it has a list price of 179. I have not seen it for sale anywhere. So uh, that that wasn't really the major issue though. And, and I saw another review, I think it was at PC Mag, the only other recent review, it was in April for this particular kit. They had all these sort of stability issues. They'd go to run a benchmark, load it up, and then it would shut down or freeze. And they thought it might be power related, but this thing has a 90 watt external power supply and you're limited to a 35 watt CPU. There are very few options in the setup to change anything. So, I mean, you can literally, you cannot change the fan profile at all. You cannot. You can change memory speed, actually, and timings, but you cannot change any of like the power limits or anything else to reconfigure a 65 watt APU, for example. Like it actually has to fit within a certain limit. And it seems that it may not necessarily be regulating power because certain higher draw benchmarks that I tried to run, like I tried to run 3D Mark graphics benchmarks, and that would shut the whole system down. And it wasn't even getting that hot. So it seems like looking around the web, most people had kind of this experience where it never really got high, higher than 60 degrees. It seems to be a sort of thermal limit that it manages. But it was not stable for me using the latest available platform drivers for A320 from AMD under Windows 10. And I, I actually shelved this. I had this review mostly done early April. And then it, it was an incomplete review. I wrote up this review that had sort of a cliffhanger ending, like I maybe it'll work with a different CPU. I have no idea. I don't have another one to test right now. And then I went back and installed Linux. I did Ubuntu, or Ubuntu 18.04 LTS, and everything worked. Wireless worked. These are all pretty common and older components on this board, so no issues there. And I didn't have a single stability problem. Obviously, I'm running different applications, some of them were the same. I was running Geekbench 5, the Linux version of that. I ran uh, Blender. I had run that on Windows as well. And every time I ran it, even when I loaded it up, I did a totally unrealistic classroom render, which was for a CPU like this. I think it was like a half hour to an hour endeavor. I don't remember exactly how long it took to complete because I left the room, but it never shut off. Like I actually had a finished render when I came back and it was pulling... 38 and a half watts from the wall during a blender run. So it's certainly when you consider the overhead of a power supply, it was well under its 35 watt limit. And that was total platform draw, including the SSD, which was an NVMe drive. Uh, I had eight gigabytes of memory installed for my Ubuntu testing and 38 and a half was the most it ever drew until I started doing graphics benchmarks. And then I could get it to, I think 45 was my absolute limit. So it it handled itself very well as a desktop productivity machine under Windows, but crashed under benchmark loads. Under Ubuntu, it didn't ever crash. I didn't have a single blue screen, any instability, it never shut down. So I, it must be a platform driver thing, or maybe it was the build of Windows I was using. So that that could be. But one of the interesting things about this is that they reached out, to, ECS reached out to me after the review was published to let me know and this is something actually it looks like they did with the PC mag editor as well. They let them know, hey, a 65 watt version of this is coming. And they didn't mention this to me in their email, but apparently they told PC mag that, yes, it will have additional ventilation. It'll have some vents on the top uh, in addition to just the front intake and the rear exhaust. So if they do that, it 
I feel like if it's still on an A320 board, it's still going to be limited. It's still like A320 is not the best supported platform AMD has. But if they move up to like B450 or something like that, then it could be a lot better than this. But under Linux, it was absolutely fine. And I was having fun. I mean, what are the chances the PCIe 4 controller is going to be semi problematic in a size? In that sort (laughs) of size. size like this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they have to they have to change the chassis to be a heatsink, I think, which would be yeah, you, fine. I mean, it, you almost you have all the, the guys that do or, that fanless tech. Uh, what is it? The the guys that do the ruggedized and all, they like, essentially the cases are always a heatsink. I can't remember I the name. Seen of the, yeah, they're from them in a while. Out. Something this small, if it if it was, if it implemented more heatsinks, because there's dead space in here, kind of around the CPU. Although that CPU cooler does take up quite a bit of room, and yeah. It it did an okay job. It's it was here's the other thing I didn't mention noise. Noise is very insignificant from this. It was like 34 decibels under load, very very quiet. You can barely hear the fan going, and that's great. But if you were able to tailor the fan curve and turn it up a little bit, then you'd have a little bit lower thermals. Perhaps you'd get higher boost clocks sustained. This isn't. I mean, it depends on what CPU you're using, of course. But this is like a three and a half gigahertz dual core CPU. So you're you're limited there anyway but on the face of it just looking at it as a kit and forgetting about the platform you're getting a sort of custom itx motherboard like a thin mini itx style motherboard you're getting a 90 watt power supply you're getting a a metal a custom metal case a visa mount kit and a custom low profile cooler but it's 180 dollars. so it seems like you can sort of rationalize the price but at the same time it's a very low end platform to be running AMD on an A320 board. Well, that's cheap though. I mean, they, yeah, it's not overly expensive, but no, it's a, I think 180 bucks, get motherboard, power supply, little case, specialized form factor, got a heat sink in there too. I think they're probably cutting that about as close as they can in terms of margins. I mean, it's not I, like they're making five bucks off of it, but you know, it wouldn't surprise yeah. me if. They were making 15 and the uh, the reseller was making about another 15 to 20 bucks. That's a good point. I mean, I, and, yeah, it, yeah, it was hard to argue about the price. I couldn't complain about it. It seems, I guess, fair. It's just it's not going to get people super excited when they have to go on eBay or somewhere to try to find that like low power variant of the 2400 G from last year or something like that to put in this. But the, the 3000 G, if you could find it at MSRP, that's only like a $50 CPU. And of course, I. I went looking right before the review published and it was going for like 80, $90. So yep. mm. 35 Watts is a tough envelope though, even for the ones that have 35 watt TDP on the outside of the box. And that's yeah, where a more curious full feature. The, uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say a more full featured board. If it gave you those like uh, granular power controls, if I could go in and say like, okay, this is my like 100 second power limit. And this is my right. like maximum threshold and whatever. And you could, you could tailor it. I'll be curious what the uh, 4000 series will be like. And, you know, if, they, if, if AMD has a skew that they're willing to do or if, uh, you know, a configurable TDP, as, you know, they previously talked about and, you know, and in past products, but we haven't heard much about lately. So, huh. Well, I mean, you know, it was, weren't you the one talking about maybe five nanometer being a possibility for some upcoming AMD chips, Josh? It would probably be mobile stuff first uh, yeah. from what I've been hearing. And, um, you know, they might have something in late 2020 this year, but it would be very, very late. And it would probably only be an announcement. And we would see products out in February of March uh, the next year uh, because five nanometer, it's apparently healthy and available, but that's still a lot of chips and a lot of wafer starts. And then, I mean, they're yeah. still just kind of getting that going. And I mean, they're still, you know, kind of balls to the wall with seven nanometer and the amount of people buying stuff from them for that particular node, which happens to be really the best node on the planet, bar none. I was just think about laptops and small form factor like this with something like five nanometer, even seven nanometer, if they weren't always chasing performance, because they, they could have even significantly lower TDP parts, even in the Zen 2 family, if they weren't pushing voltage and pushing clocks so high. But Oh, yeah, you'd get a 3.2 base to 3.8 uh, with a 4-core, a 8-thread, and that would, that would be able to hit 
35 watt TDP yeah. pretty easy with uh, with that architecture. It's just once you start getting above four gigahertz, uh, you know, boost rates and 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 uh, you know approaching three seven three eight with base clocks that you that you start really ramping up the TDPs. Yes. Well, just add some more of those vents. You can't you can't <laughs> put it in the bookshelf like that anymore. But I know, I know, but uh, that wasn't really recommended. I, I admit that I wasn't actually using it that way. Because uh, that would just make it worse, because I'd be insulating the metal. Although there weren't even, I wasn't blocking any vents. And by the way, those are actually, if you're listening to the audio version, I had this concept. Like they said, book size. So of course, I run to a bookshelf. I grab a bunch of, I would say, my most presentable-looking hardcover books and lined them all up on this desk right here, and took a couple of like lifestyle-looking photos. So yeah, yeah I, I can't believe you you actually showed off your Longfellow in public there. Mm -hmm. Hard to believe. You no, know, it's an old book. I've never really oh, it's a been book. a Longfellow oh. fan, but it's that book was published. I think my copy is from eighteen ninety seven. Oh wow! So I have a few really old books. That's yeah, really I accidentally kind of misread Mallory as Malort and almost had to start <laughs> vomiting. <laughs> See, the, that's that's like the, the little joke with this picture, by the way, is that I have Mallory and a Connecticut Yankee book ending, the Leva. And of course, Connecticut Yankee is based on the Arthurian myth from Thomas Mallory. So the mort to Arthur on one side, the death of Arthur, Connecticut Yankee, King Arthur's court, where of course he goes back in time to King Arthur's court. So that there's there's a little oh, literary so that's quite the there. In there. there. I, is, is I that assume Guinevere in the middle. Is it should be. Yeah, it should be Guinevere in the middle. Oh. I'm oh, going to yeah. have to assume that all of your photography <laughs> is this meta. By the way, in the future, yeah, is there's it? there's all yeah. sorts of things. Okay, just I, look, just check it. Just want to make sure that you're always this meta. I used into the chat. I used Longfellow because I have it and. As a kid, I wanted to like it because it was an old book, and I thought old books were cool. But I still have that. I've had that. As you get older, years. you start to get a Longfellow. Mm. Yeah, or two. I was impressed by that copy of uh, Defoe's uh, Robinson Crusoe, though. The, the introduction is like an entire biography of him, which I've not read. So, mm. having some fun with that. This is what happens. You get down these rabbit holes with your props. Well, all right. So it's a. Uh... As, as uh, Sebastian said, it's it's an interesting category that has had far too few AMD options for far too long. Uh, this one isn't perfect, but if it works for your your power limit and your your uh, uh, motherboard, uh, your chipset uh, limitations and processor choice, uh, you know it's an interesting little option there for only uh, 180 bucks. That's the, again the ECS Leva SF110 A320. Hey, speaking of imperfect things. Let's 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 talk about fractal design. I like fractal design. I think I've probably gave the editor's choice to the last two or three define like flagship cases in a row. When I was reviewing, I know I did like I love the R5. The R6 is I think still the best case they've ever produced. And then the Define 7 came out. We got the Define 7 XL, so the full tower, just monstrous case, and it's. It's an extremely impressive case. They do very good overall case design. It, obviously, they're a low noise first for the Define series. They have the Meshify series. They have higher airflow options out there. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't go hard on a case just because it has uh, higher temps than an airflow case. That's not what this is. This is a low noise compact enclosure. So there's going to be a lot more warm air building up inside of this. If, since it doesn't have a, an open front panel. And we'll talk about, we can talk about temps, but my issues with this were the implementation of the Define 7 uh, sort of design language into the smaller form factor didn't really work. So they tried to make the, the component chamber bigger. So one of the advantages of this, of this case over the previous Define C and the Meshify C is that it's a little bit longer. You have more space inside for like, putting in a long graphics card and having front mounted fans or a radiator or something that's just like 20, 30 millimeters more width, depending on which case you're comparing it to. But in making the component chamber a little bit bigger, I have not actually dragged out one of the old cases to measure the space behind the motherboard tray. 
But there was less space for cables behind the motherboard tray than any previous fractal case I can remember. And the Define 7XL had a lot of the same attributes as this one, as far as the totally modular top panel, where you get a kit in the box that allows you to switch to a ventilated panel instead of a solid insulated panel, which is great. And it just snaps right off. It's easy to, to exchange the two. The door panels, like the sides, snap off. It uses that style of snap that I first saw on Leon Lee cases, the aluminum stuff that kind of snap together. And it's fine, but you, I, I have had the benefit of using the Define R6, for example. And that case was the first one I remember from them that used uh, snaps instead of having thumb screws to hold on the tempered glass side panel, for example. And it was very clean aesthetic. It's nice. But it also had your traditional like brackets on the back where you could put in a thumb screw and it you couldn't see it from the front, but it would hold the this panel in place. And they actually shipped the Define R6 in the box with the thumb screws attached just to keep the side panels on during shipping. And with the, the seven, they don't have those anymore. So it's fine. I mean the snaps are fairly strong. I don't know what the the life is and how many snaps you have before they start to get looser or not. But with this case it was this bad combination of not having any alternative to keep your side panels on and having predominantly only 17 millimeters of space between the back of the motherboard tray and the inside of the rear panel. So it's insufficient to use anything but ribbon cables that are arranged just so, so that they're all flat. And I was using a fractal power supply, the Ion Plus 860, and it's all ribbon cables except for the ATX power connector, which is a big you know, round cable with a uh, braided cover on it. And I could not get the side panel on using this power supply because I route cables behind the motherboard tray to make everything look neat inside the component side. You pretty much have to leave your ATX cable in the component chamber or it's not going, the rear panel is not going to close. I tried to force it. I moved everything around. There just wasn't enough space from the grommet, the grommeted cable opening that I was using down to the power supply, it invariably uh, pushed the door back off. And a couple of times it, it fell off. Well, I, I got to that point. I, I threw it down and got on top of it and just pounded it into submission. And I got it to stay on finally to finish my build, to do the noise and temperature testing. And then it flew off of the side of the desk. <laughs> and I, I had a uh, Dark Rock Pro 4 cooler sitting on a box like nearby, and it went right into the side of it and like smashed in the fins on the cooler. This was after I was already annoyed with the fact that I couldn't get the door on. And, and so I'm like, okay, there has to be a way. And I looked and the door bracket on the back has a little tab with a screw hole in it, just like the R6 did. But then I pulled off the front panel. I'm looking around. There is nothing to screw it to. So it's it's like they repurposed some existing tooling and design. They put uh, it together into a new case, but they omitted a way to use thumb screws as an option. No so, thumb screws in the tool in the in the in the kit bag and the in the attachment. Well, it's toolless. You know, so hardware bag. No oh, to, even well. if it didn't include them, I would have just grabbed some spares. But there was nowhere to screw. Into. Oh, so there's no yes. hole. I oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Tell so, us about that hinge. That hinge look. Yeah. That did not it, look yeah, good. And that's the other thing. Like when they first implemented snaps to attach the doors with the R6, it was, if you're familiar with modern cases, a lot of them have like a lip along the bottom of the side panel that is either hooked or just flat and you push it up against the bottom of the chassis and then you kind of close it and it snaps in place at the top. And there are several cases that use this design. With this, it's a series of these sort of hinges. They look like half of a door hinge. And there's just slots for them on the bottom of the chassis. And it's it's fairly easy to install. It's super easy to install because there's so much play. So you put this into a rather large slot. It's It's kind of like a hot dog down a hallway. There's a lot of space around these hinges, but they're a little bit loose. So when you actually get the door panel on and snap it against the top. Metaphor. A little bit more. I think you detail. could probably explain that metaphor in a little bit more detail, Josh. 
loose well, in the places it's... you don't want. I haven't Tight I haven't reading. heard that sentence since. Anyway, oh, you should put it on a on. T-shirt. Oh yeah, what's our what's that? Mm, link? Yeah, that's a good idea. It's not PC Put it on a T-shirt, com. man. Jim, what's that link? Josh Josh Tech Tech com. Oh, Josh Tech dot com. Lord. That's J O S H T E K K dot com. I've got to regain my edge because I'm, I'm I've gotten old and crotchety. I just <sighs> that's also the name of her underwear. I, guess I need brand. to drink more. <laughs> that's always the answer we could keep on i could keep on complaining about this case there are many redeeming qualities about it i love the new top okay panel. i do have I one question great. yeah some of the reviews that i saw they actually really liked the removal top panel because they could get elbow, elbows deep in the system without mm-hmm. having to navigate from the side i looked at it and i looked at your review and i'm thinking that sounds nice but i don't know that it's actually true did you find oh, yeah. that You'd like it to, was reasonable yeah. to work I mean, on it with an air cooler, you're off? just asking to get cut up, though, right? <laughs> right. It, I like it when you can get the top panel off just to install the, the damn uh, PSU, like the, the CPU power. Why am I forgetting what these are? EPS cables? Oh, the, the eight pin on the top. Yeah. Oh, one. fair. It's a yeah, lot easier to so kind ears. of put yeah, your arm e, in the uh, top. EPS, the EPS cable. Yeah. yeah. So that was easier just because of that. That was nice. And. It, that bracket that you see in that photo we were just looking at if you're watching the video version that comes off with a couple of screws so that i mean the everything comes out the top just snaps into place there is a, a screen filter that sort of slides into place beneath that so it's fully filtered although this uses that same filter design for the front panel that the big defined seven does which is there is no full filter it's these little filters that line the inside edges of the front panel so you have to are those pull removable out. yeah it's like an mm-hmm. inch wide and the full length of the front panel i forgot to take a picture mm-hmm. of it but i have that in the define 7 xl review so once again I mean, if we talk about the actual performance of the case say you use a psu that has all ribbon cables you don't even bother routing behind the motherboard because you don't care and or you buy the the seven compact and you don't get the tempered glass version so you don't worry about the way it looks you'd have no issue snapping the back panel back into place so then it just becomes a matter of well how does it perform very very quiet uh it was testing the lower limits of my sound pressure meter which isn't too hard because it's it's rated for down to 30 decibels plus minus 1.4 db but it only ever really reads down to about 30 and a half or 31 so this was reading like 30.6 30.7 so who knows what it actually was but then when it under load it was really quiet still like we were talking under 33 decibels under load temps though were so high compared to the last two smaller cases i've reviewed which was the dark base 500 dx and then before that the corsair iq 220 uh, t using the exact same components like i have the same motherboard i just drop in that already has the cpu and cooler and everything on it and it was 10 degrees higher 10 or 11 degrees higher in the Define 7 Compact. So I thought, okay, I, something's gone wrong. I don't have the CPU cooler mounted properly. So I trashed my initial thermal results, took off the CPU cooler, cleaned the CPU and the cooler with alcohol, put it all back with fresh thermal paste, reran it, and it was exactly the same, plus minus one degree. So I it, it was CPU uh, like adjusted for uh, ambient. So the deltas were 50.4 degrees on the CPU under load with the vented top and then it was about a degree and a half higher with the solid top 52.1 that doesn't sound too bad and it's not it's just that you compare it to the high airflow cases i've tested recently and of course they're high airflow and they were 10 degrees or more below that so i took the front panel off reran the test sure enough it was almost identical to the airflow cases so it's literally just a matter of it not taking in enough air it has a single 140 millimeter fan, has a, a narrow strip to pull in air, and then there's, it would probably work, but to maximize space inside the enclosure, the fan is really far towards the front panel of the case. Like it's not protruding very far into the enclosure. If they were to use one of those, you know, horrible Dell style shrouds on the inside like a big plastic thing to help direct air and then 
uh, had the fan protruding further into the case and drawing air more effectively from those front slots. I think this could be designed a little bit differently. It could be modified. You could use some spacers or something and put a second 140 millimeter fan in there, get better thermals. The thermals were not terrible though, but it was like a fiery furnace behind this thing. Like I was running, I, I started a few case reviews ago doing a simulated gaming load where I just take the Metro Exodus benchmark uh, utility and you can just punch in however many iterations you want. So just have this thing running endlessly as if it was a long gaming session and just measure the, the highest like package temps and GPU temps during that gaming session. So it got really hot. Like the air inside the system was just on fire. So you had to take the side panel off, like in between tests, I had to take the side panel off, take the top off, take the front off and just wait for the whole system to cool down, put it all back together again. Once I got my idle temps back and I could do the next test, but it's, it gets pretty hot in there, but it's not out of control. It's just like with anything, it, it'll, you'll have a CPU start to thermally manage itself because it's running a little high. This cooler isn't the best cooler. I mean, it's, it's good. It's the Cooler Master 212 RGB Black Edition. Good performance, not as good as like a dual tower cooler would have been. One of the things I do like about this is that there was ample room to put a 240 mm, millimeter radiator up top without any clearance issues. So I think this case would do really well with an all-in-one liquid cooler of some kind. For the CPU. But you'd have to run the open top in order to... Yes. Exhaust, yeah. right? Yeah. Open, That's kind of yeah, what's, open top what's didn't really do that much of a it didn't really change the sound that much though. Oh. It was I wouldn't less think than so. a What's the top redeeming quality here? Excellent build quality. Uh it looks nice. So yeah, it, it just it's don't a cut you. design case. But okay, here's 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 the, the positives. Pretty, pretty pretty inexpensive, right? Uh, $110 for the yeah. tempered glass version. Okay, that's... They did, uh, yep. they, okay. 100 bucks if you didn't want panel, the solid. Top panel is outstanding. They have upgraded that. If you compare it to the previous case, I have a picture of the top panel in there somewhere, but they've, they've added two USB 2 ports in addition to the original f- two USB 3 ports, and there's a USB Type-C port up top. So you have all your modern connectivity, plenty of like quality of life connectivity up top. And then the front panel... It, it physically looks great in person. The front panels of all of these always used to just be a plastic that looked like brushed aluminum. And now it actually is brushed aluminum. So just the front panel, though. So in appearance, it's got that like really kind of monolithic, stylish, understated appearance of a fractal design case. They've kind of upped their design game a little bit with an aluminum front panel. It's very quiet. It's just... I feel like they should have made the component chamber a little bit smaller so they could have had more room for cable management. So the cable management was absolutely an afterthought with this design. So. so they could have pushed the component chamber a little bit closer to the glass and given you more cable management room. That's what you're saying. Yeah, and it's not like they're it's not like they were trying to make room for a vertical GPU mount because this does not have one. So yeah. there was there was enough room to give a few more millimeters to the rear. The re- and the rear panel The rear area itself is, they've used this design numerous times now over the last few years. This is almost exactly the same as the Meshify C. It's just a Meshify C with a solid front panel and some some changes to the top uh, panel design, essentially. And so you've still got just like this very average two hard drive cage that sits at the bottom left and uh, insufficient. It's hard to tell in the photo, but the rear panel is mostly pressed almost against the inside of the rear door. And you have a recessed area on the left side where you can see Fractal has their, their um, the majority of their cables right out of the box. And that's pretty much it for your cable routing. If you can yeah, somehow I, I kind of like the hard drive. I kind of like the hard drive cage that uh, if you look back at the picture, looks like it's slowly getting squished. Yeah. <laughs> it was not square. <laughs> I did not try to bend it. It's just how it arrived. Well, for one hundred and ten dollars, I didn't. I didn't think it was really that great because they offer better cases. I just buy a Meshify C for eighty nine bucks because your system will not. There you be, go. Here's the great mystery. Do okay insulated cases. I'm not going to go on a huge tangent here, but the the era of obnoxious CPU fans 
that I mean, a high performance CPU fan back in the day was like 5,000 RPMs and it was annoying. And then your CPU, your GPU fans were typically whining. And I can understand why companies like Be Quiet got started just making insulating panels. And Fractal Design makes cases with these insulating panels. But at some point, when we have big, low RPM fans and the ability to make a really quiet case that's still a high airflow case. I'd live with one more decibel, get into that 34 decibel range to have an open front, like a mesh front. And the mesh 5C is a fantastic case. That's a, it's a versatile case. Uh, you see it everywhere. You see it at trade shows. You see it in builds all over the place because it's, it's small. It's inexpensive for what it is. And it looks great. Temps are great. And I would rather have a, a, a case like the mesh if I see and use a low speed intake fan and CPU cooler then have much higher temps in a case like this because it's insulated. But hey, there's a market for this, certainly, or they wouldn't make these cases. All right, so again, that's the, uh, the Fractal Define 7 Compact with the tempered glass, 110, you said? 99 for the version with the solid side panel. All right, well, just make sure, though, if you're using a power supply that it has uh, thin, uh, not too long cabling because you don't have a lot of yeah. room back there. Okay. Uh, all right, Jim. All right. So I got to yeah, run. Josh has got to take off. Sorry, it's, Josh. Uh, he's got to go to work uh, because it's Thursday night. So he'll be installing security patches and software updates and whatnot. So we'll wish him the best. And uh, Patch we're going to miss the keycaps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Boy. Ooh. Yep. Might be he worth it talk. for me to lose my job to listen to that. Hey, yep. the, word, the word pudding is in it. True. Pudding. It's pudding. You yeah. like pudding, All right, Josh. guys. Have a good okay. night. Like what? Thanks, Josh. See See you. What pudding? All right. Well, we're back to the show. Uh, that was a disaster. So you got to watch live, folks. So you can see me, first of all, turn into the texture model from a late 90s FPS and then uh, have my background, my alpha background, absorb half of Sebastian's screen. So yeah, that won't be in the edited version. All right. No. Back to the show. You do need to replace your blue background with something surprising. Uh, well, I didn't, nobody sent me anything this week, at least that I saw. Oh, well, what happened to you? Well, my electricity just failed, but, uh, my machine is on UPS right now. How good is your <laughs> UPS? <laughs> oh, let's just give it up. Is that pure sine wave? That's some nice uh, lightning you got going there. Did you see it? Or at least it actually came into the lightning. lightning. I like how you've let just, me like, totally just my, uh, my Let me see if I can adjust my, uh, this, there's nothing realer than this. There's nothing more live than it is right now. I got to tell mm -hmm. you that right now. You know so what? Let me see how sensitive is that sensor? Uh, if hang it on, let me see for if I can... this illumination from the HyperX Quadcast mic, not a sponsor, but you know, we invite you to be. Oh wow, HyperX! That, I'm overdriving my brightness right now. Well, how much juice you got on that UPS? That's actually not bad. It's not um, wonderful, it isn't but terrible. It's, not bad. Oh, hang on, it's like hang on, hang on. early YouTube. Oh, let there be light. There Hang on. That's how much we care Jeez. about this podcast. We want to, it goes through power outages, rainstorms, lightning, nothing. Nothing can stop this. Uh, well, actually, I have not. Ryan and Ken have done it in a the car. They, you know, they, they murder hornets, plague, nothing quits. Doesn't will stop not us. Be stopped. Ryan and Ken were so dedicated. They live streamed like eight hours of them sleeping together in a hotel with Alan. Yes. If you all remember. I believe that. That one. Oh, that yeah. One the road trip. On. The infamous road trip. Yep. Yeah. You know, among the guests on that road trip were Linus from Linus mm -hmm. Media Group. Uh, I called in at one point and behaved like an idiot. And I don't remember who else. Maybe Kyle? Somebody. There were a oh, few Kyle people. Just went out. A couple of times. Yeah. So it was entertaining. I phoned in early, but then said, screw it, because I wanted to go to bed. And then remember, uh, we Jim, used it's, to a, do... um, it's an APC 1500, by the way. Just wanted to let you know that. Okay, well, well, that that? As well. we had that question in the YouTube chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, APC 1500 with a it's a 24 volt, so um, yeah. it's got some it's mm -hmm. got some guts. Mm -hmm. Super, All right. this is an overclocked 8700K, so well, there, yeah, oh, so you're, you're running Intel, so it's just gonna suck that thing dry in like five minutes. You know, we'll uh, probably have way, 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, Buff Barnaby in the YouTube chat wants to know did he miss seeing Jeremy take a drag? He had a short break. 
He's trying to fill out his podcast bingo card. So it's, oh, I don't know. Not, Any help? You have to see it to check it. You can't just say like, oh, yeah, I but heard I have to light it again because I started talking. You have to see him. Yeah. Okay, uh, so our next review, let's get back on track here. Sebastian, uh, he this is That's a review impossible. that he did last week, and it's a uh, a set of uh, custom keycaps from HyperX. It's the double shot but if he's only pudding caps. If he's only eating 20 to 40% meat, why does he get pudding? Pudding is, well... You can't that, have any pudding if you don't eat your meat. <laughs> okay. I eat my textured vegetable protein. Oh God! Does that count? It's, that's anyway. I don't know what I'm doing here. I, I have a couple of these. I, I have a, a keyboard with the previous version of these keycaps on it, and then I, this is the new version. You have to look at the review pictures carefully. There's one picture where I compare them side by side because the review I did was on the refreshed version of the HyperX white pudding keycaps. They have a white and black pudding style. The difference is this sort of uh, paint finish they're dipped in kind of looks like a pudding. It looks sort of like a French dip, I guess like the, the if this will focus, you could probably see it better in the review because there's a translucent uh, plastic that is only painted on the upper like third. And what this does is gives you uh, this significant increase in RGB glow out the sides of your keys. Now this the aesthetics of that are going to be a matter of personal taste. The the old version had kind of a a little bit of a weird font on the keys, and I I don't know. It this one it looks better. I think they went with all caps and slightly blockier text and stuff, but they're essentially the same. These are double shot PBT keycaps. So if you haven't used double shot PBT, this is just a PSA. You owe it to yourself. It will make an $80 keyboard feel like a $200 keyboard. Like for every time I've ever been impressed by a high-end keyboard and then gone back to a cheaper one, I think a lot of that was just the fact that I was going back to thinner ABS keys. And it sounds like a weird thing. PBT is a significantly stronger plastic. And for whatever reason, it you really feel it. I think it's partly the way they're made, just the mechanical aspect of this, because it's two layers of plastic pushed together instead of one thin walled piece of plastic. They they make the keys themselves feel like they have different switches under them. If you haven't, if you put them on your existing keyboard. So this is a $25 upgrade that will make your keyboard feel a lot better. If you don't like the pudding style, I think they have non-pudding keycaps, but I've, I'm, I'm talking HyperX here. Because of course you can get any manner of them. Go to a place like mechanicalkeyboards.com and just, just they have stuff that like 50, 60, $70 a set. These are 25, and it's a full 104 key set. And they come in white and black. They feel fantastic. So I think it's I think it's absolutely worth it for 25 bucks. Give it the gold award. They're not absolutely perfect. It's not a flawless product. They do have kind of some weird machine marks on the upper edge that the previous version had too. I think it's just the way they paint them. And it leaves like these little marks, which you can't see when they're installed. So there is that. Anyway, check out the photos to see if if you can live with that very, very pastel RGB glow you get from the sides. Can you hear the thunder outside? Because oh, yeah. it means yes, business. Oh, yeah. Well, we're going to... Is Alan let's... backing up his raid still? Uh, no. I don't know. Hopefully he's on battery backup. <laughs> I know he is. That's I know he's right. got, he's got plenty of backup. He's actually hooked up to the Tesla, isn't he? Raid, raid is backup. Raid is backup, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, of course it is. Yeah, totally. Raid zero, especially. I mean, it's yeah, exactly. raid. Raid, so, all raid is, yeah. is the same. But anyway, raid is as, backup. As Side note: No, it's not. As Sebastian tried <laughs> to transition us in, some other glowy stuff he took a look at. Uh, we we looked at the. This is the Corsair Dominator Platinum RGB memory. We looked at the original launch of this with their new Capellix LEDs mm -hmm. like a year ago. Uh, yep. But uh, this one is in white. White and the, gold. So they didn't, they didn't and mention gold. the gold. And I opened it up, and there's there's quite a bit of gold here. There's gold bolts holding the because the, if you haven't dealt with the the ultra high end of Corsair's lineup, this is their highest end memory, the Dominator series. This is the Dominator Platinum RGB, as Jim just said, mm -hmm. and they are bolted together. This is aluminum heat sinks. 
I have a teardown picture where you can see that it's it's like a, a bunch of metal and bolts and different parts. The the LED portion of it has actually a separate board. The Compellix LEDs are on their own board, which then connects with a ribbon cable to the actual PCB of the memory. And it's an impressively built piece of memory. Like this is it's one hundred and seven dollars for a sixteen gigabyte stick. This is piece. This is DDR four thirty two hundred cast six memory a close-up picture of the samsung uh i think this is i think it's c die it's not b die it's not d die i believe if i'm reading this correctly that it's c die you can read it for yourself and i wrote down the uh the actual chips so you can look them up but i could not find a product sheet for this particular chip on samsung's website uh Performance is very good. I mean, I didn't go through a bunch of benchmarks because Jim already did that. This is exactly the same memory as we had last year. It's just a new finish. So if you like the matte black look, they still offer that. If you like this sort of matte, it's like an eggshell finish with gold. It does really show off the LEDs a lot more, I think. I think anytime you have a light background, like with those keycaps, you it just reflects a lot more of the sort of stray light around and it makes them look brighter than the black ones did. So if you're into that, if that's what you want in your case, uh, the performance was fine. And in fact, I was able to make these. I looked up the next model up, which is a 3600 CAS 18, which is like $700 for a 64 gigabyte kit like this one. And I only had to increase the voltage from 1.35 to 1.36 volts to have them totally stable in a long eight of 64 memory stress test and it was totally stable on windows and then benchmarks and stuff. So you can make these into the next set up with a nominal increase in voltage as far as, you know, this R sample goes, but this particular set, because it is the 3200 CAS 16, not the 3600 CAS 18, it's like $429. But bear in mind, this is a 64 gigabyte kit so it's four 16 gigabyte DIMMs of their highest end memory. And yeah, you can buy DDR4 16 gigabyte DIMMs for as little as 60 bucks each. That's like the budget stuff. Overclocking memory though, like this, you get into the HyperX. Uh, I don't think it's the Fury. It's the next one above that. I'm forgetting the Crucial Ballistics stuff. I think it's the Predator, HyperX Predator. They're all around the same. They're like 80, 90, $100 a DIMM. So it's kind of it's right there with the rest of the stuff that's on the market, but it is somewhat unique. I mean, I've seen white dims from Corsair before. I think the Vengeance series had one, or still does. But anyway, just a style update. Nothing new inside, unless that C die memory, if that's what it is, is new. All right, check that out. Check out the full review there. And uh, uh, by the way, I will I will interrupt just briefly to point out that I. I couldn't help myself. I had to start the review with a little history lesson. So I talked about the fact that Corsair started making Coast modules in 1994. Coast, which is cash on a stick. Back when, you know, cash became this optional upgrade thing because Pentiums really didn't need external cash like the 46s did. But then companies offered Coast modules. You could just plug that into your board and get a little bit better performance out of your Pentium-based system. So, in fact, I have a Dell XPS system from the beginning of the Pentium era with a Coast module in it. It's not a Corsair, though. So if they want to send me one, I will review it. We're going to take a break here. We're going to thank our sponsor this week. We'll be right back. Today's show is sponsored by Text Expander, an incredibly powerful and handy tool for Windows, Mac OS, iOS, and Chrome that can save you hours of time by automating, simplifying, and correcting text input. At a basic level, Text Expander runs in the background and automatically inputs your custom text, including images, whenever you type a corresponding abbreviation. For example, you can configure Text Expander with a snippet, as they're called, that contains your full signature, including name, job title, email, and phone number. You then assign that snippet to an abbreviation that's easy to remember, but unlikely to be typed otherwise. So in this case, you might use something like ZSIG, SIG for signature and the letter Z in front to prevent an unintentional snippet call. Then from virtually any application that supports text input, just type Z SIG and your full signature will appear. But that's just the tip of the iceberg for text expander. You can configure snippets that are hundreds, even thousands of words long if desired. You can add images and formatting that is automatically applied. You can even add automatically calculated variables such as the current date or time 
and then input date calculations, such as adding or subtracting dates and times from that current date. For example, let's say you have a small business that sends order updates to customers, noting the date the order was received and the expected ship date, which for your company is generally one week. With Text Expander, your snippets can contain all of the normal text you send to customers, including images, and variables that list the current date as well as the date one week from then. This type of email, which might take an employee three or four minutes to type out normally, can now be automatically generated in one second by typing in the handful of characters you chose as the snippet's abbreviation. Text Expander even allows for more flexibility by allowing snippets to have predefined fill-ins. These can be single or multi-line fields, an optional either or selection, or a pop-up menu of choices. And if you have trouble thinking of some of your own snippets to create, you can even subscribe to public snippet groups that focus on auto-correcting common business and product names, fixing contractions and words with accented letters, automatically generating lorem ipsum placeholder text, and cleaning up and properly formatting copied JSON scripts. And because Text Expander is available on so many platforms, no matter how you set up your snippets, you can sync and share them with all of your devices and even other Text Expander users. All of these features are great for individual users, but there's also Text Expander for Teams and Enterprise, which not only lets users share their business related snippets, but supports important features such as single sign on, usage statistics, and user and group permissions allowing businesses to decide who can use and edit their shared snippets. At a basic level, the way Text Expander works seems so simple, but when you start to use it and see how flexible and customizable it is, you quickly realize how incredibly powerful it can be. Even if you end up using only short snippets, if it saves you a few seconds on each action that you perform dozens or hundreds of times per day, then you're looking at major time savings over the long run. There's so much Text Expander can do. If you'd like to see more examples of how it all works and get some ideas for your own snippets, head over to TextExpander.com slash videos, where they have some great video tutorials. And also check out TextExpander.com slash webinar for interesting webinars and improving your productivity. I've used Text Expander for years, and I really think that once you try it out, you're going to be hooked. You can check out a free 30-day trial, and once you're ready to buy, be sure to get 20% off your first year by heading to textexpander.com slash podcast and choosing PC Perspective from the Where Did You Hear About Us drop-down menu. Again, that's 20% off your first year at textexpander.com slash podcast and choosing PC Perspective from the drop-down menu. Thanks so much to Text Expander for supporting the PC Perspective podcast. And we're back. Um, Let's go into some news this week. Uh, so first up, there was a story that broke, I think last Friday, it was like just out, like a day or so after we uh, finished our, our podcast last week. And uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's some bad news out of uh, Corsair, but uh, yeah. they're, 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 do, they're dealing with it. They came out uh, on Friday with a blog post saying, hey, uh, you know, our SF series of power supplies, uh, if you have a certain lot code, made between a certain time period, there could be a failure. And uh, what they said here was, quote, uh, we have found a potential issue that can manifest when the PSU is exposed to a combination of temperatures and high humidity. And they further uh, further on in their statement said it, it could happen like the minute you buy it, unwrap it and plug it in, it could fail then or it could fail over time. So uh, if you're in this affected range, it's uh, we'll have the, the details on the site here and a link to this uh, post over at Corsair support form. Uh, they're doing a free, uh, uh, oh, Brett just lost his lights again. <laughs> but, uh, they're doing a, uh, hopefully he'll stay with us here. Um, they're doing a free long as I uh, can. advanced replacement. <laughs> so they, they know that you're not going to, you know, especially if it was working already and you're doing this out of caution, they don't want to like have your system down while you replace it. So they're going to send you the new one. You, you go to this link, register, they'll send you the new one with a box, send the old one back when you get the new one. And, uh, and they, sh they said they should be fine. And if you're not within these ranges, they're pretty confident that it's limited to this range of lot codes and dates. Um, so check that out. Also, they did, they did say too that uh, it, don't worry about damaging your components. This, this flaw or this issue arises on the, the power supply side of things. It doesn't jump the bridge into uh, uh, the component side. So it, it can't harm your system. It would just stop working, but you wouldn't get any surges or anything that would damage your other components. Uh, so check Unlike the SF600 that I'm currently running that is under an extreme amount of stress right now, which is a Corsair, which is getting my thumbs up right now. So oh, an yeah. earlier SF600 <laughs> is weathering. 
Yeah, Corsair makes great power supplies. I run a lot of them. Uh, and, but if I your put, UPS is doing its job, yeah, that power supply should be just fine. Oh, it should be just not, not shouldn't even know there was a problem. Big if. Yeah. It's, it's so smooth right now, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so back back on track here. Uh, we've got the uh, the next story we're talking about is that the Nook roadmap had leaked. Now this is the second leak of this roadmap of Intel's increasingly uh, robust line of small form factor PCs. We reviewed the Hades Canyon, um, or not the Hades Canyon, the Ghost, uh, Ghost Canyon one a couple, uh, maybe a month or two ago. That's the new one that uses uh, custom PCI expansion uh, and, and can work with an extra full-size external graphics card. Uh, we looked at the, Go or the Hades Canyon one, Intel code names, man. Uh, we, so they looked at the Hades Canyon one a couple of years ago. That's, that was the Cabby Lake G that had the uh, strange marriage of Intel processor with AMD integrated Vega graphics. Uh, and so what has leaked now, uh, earlier this year, uh, I think it was Fanless Tech got a, a leak. And now this is a new one of, of an alleged roadmap for Intel's Nook. And it shows uh, some interesting stuff here. So if you're on the audio only version, basically uh, you're looking at 2020 and 2021. And the way it's laid out, you would pres presume that means through 2021. So to the end, of 2021. And at the top there is that Ghost Canyon Nook 9 Extreme that Sebastian reviewed. And it doesn't show any updates on the roadmap, if this is accurate, if this is genuine, through the end of 2021. So that's an interesting point, because one of the questions we uh, we got when we were reviewing that was, are we ever going to see another one of these? Like, what's the upgrade path? Are they going to actually come out with PCIe 4 when they're ready and, and have new options and you know go to 10th gen processors? Because that was a 9th gen based product. And uh, based on this, it, it doesn't it doesn't look like it. And then the the Hades Canyon follow on. So this would be again that replacement for that uh, Cabby Lake G part. Uh, that's going to go to Tiger Lake U, which we know is coming. That's the uh, successor to Ice Lake, and so that's good ten nanometer Intel goodness there. Uh, but what it lists here though is third party graphics. Now that could mean that it's just an option, uh, but it doesn't say Z graphics or Chi or how, however I still don't have a definitive answer on how to pronounce Intel's uh, new graphics initiative, but the XE graphics, it doesn't list that there. So does that indicate that for, for a more gaming focused, higher performance, more expensive nook like that, that Intel's graphics wouldn't be suitable in that platform. They're just not powerful enough. So they would go with, you know, maybe another AMD embedded solution or a discrete, uh, maybe, maybe in NVIDIA. I mean, I'm not sure what their plans are. That would be weird. It would be I, weird. I, I... I believe a Snapdragon in there before an NVIDIA chip. Uh, sure, although I mean, the, Intel's <laughs> Intel's experiment on on Hades Canyon wasn't uh, great. If you remember, Intel had to finally release the AMD graphics driver update because, uh, mm -hmm. like, AMD stopped releasing updates, and then Intel had to really. Or maybe, maybe I'm getting that backwards. But basically, they weren't cooperating as we would have hoped at the start of that initiative uh, for some reason. So. Uh, very interesting. I don't know what, what do you guys think about uh, this. I know Sebastian because you reviewed uh, the uh, Ghost Canyon. Uh, what do you think? Uh, it's disappointing that they're not. Well, I don't know. I, I feel like it might end up being kind of a dead end product if if it takes that long for them to update. Why would the compute unit be compatible with this? But you know, it it seemed kind of like a one and done product anyway. But yeah, I mean, I, I've I haven't really followed these roadmaps a lot. It seems like they're ever changing. It's like a GISA code on an AMD CPU. It's just, you can never, you can never just like this is this is the point right here. This no no now this version now it's on 05. now it's on 05 revision two and 06 is coming. So I I have no idea what's going on. I feel like they they probably don't even know. I think it's telling that for his Computex speech, which of course Computex been. I think it's just been delayed or has it been canceled, but uh, it was uh, on online. They had a, a series of uh, press oh, okay. conferences, including Bob Swan so, from Intel. Yeah. So Bob Swan, who apparently was talking and then kind of transitioned right into the current Intel position, which is the benchmarks don't don't run benchmarks. They're not realistic. We're not focused on benchmarks because they're not winning benchmarks. So, mm -hmm. of course, they're not focused on benchmarks right now. So the impetus like for them is obviously that they don't have the core and thread and overall performance crown when they're compared to what AMD has on the market. So like their, their high end desktop CPU stops at 18 cores. 
and their regular like consumer desktop CPU stops at 10 cores and they can only make up so much ground with higher clock speeds. And it seems like they've had to continue. I mean, they obviously have had to continue falling back on 14 nanometer time and time again, because they just don't have the clocks and the performance at a 10 nanometer that they need, not to mention the yields. Mm. They could release 10 nanometer products. They could have already released them at lower clock speeds with lower performance than ninth gen, which they were not willing to do. It makes sense in certain situations like certain low power laptops. But other than that one Dell XPS two and one, what has really even come out with a 10 nanometer processor in it? Oh, there's, there's been a number. And the names are driving me insane. Okay. Well, and of course I'm forgetting that Apple has now like a a little, a couple of does. Yeah, so it's, it, uh, and the uh, the Surface Laptop three, the Intel variants of those, because those also come in the Ryzen edition. But the Intel variants are Ice Lake as well. They're they're getting there, but again, it's it's laptops only. It's the higher end stuff, and the clocks aren't great. The graphics were great. Graphics, huge improvement in graphics uh, on those Gen eleven graphics. But uh, that's what I was looking forward to the most. We talk about small form factor stuff like these Nook roadmaps. Well, that's where I wanted to see Gen eleven graphics because Gen eleven graphics not only are they up to the level or better than an AMD APU, depending on the test, but they support integer scaling, which was a big deal. That's yeah. to me, because you can do things like, it's a lower power graphics solution. However, it still looks sharp and great if you're running at a lower resolution. So you could set your game down to 720 on a 1080 monitor and it still looks crisp. Mm-hmm. Instead of having that soft, interpolated, blurry scaling that your monitor does. So let the GPU do the scaling. Older games like GOG games and DOSBox look amazing. Emulator games look amazing, which is what I like it for. But then at the same time, I've, I've done testing where I just run gaming benchmarks at a lower res on like a 1440p panel running at 1080. Looks amazing with integer scaling. So if you want the high resolution panel for productivity, but you don't necessarily have the GPU horsepower for gaming, you don't have to have that blurry compromise that you've had to do in the past because most monitors have dreadful scalers in them. So it, I keep on waiting for that next Intel Nook to come out with Gen 11. And that's been the kind of surprise to me. It, maybe they didn't have the yields they wanted. Maybe everything available goes into the laptop SKUs. But you'd think they would at least have one Nook with Gen 11 graphics. But we got well, the, the Nook 9 Extreme, which uses third party graphics. Right. The, right. If, 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 I mean, unless they're going to do something crazy, Tiger Lake U in this Hades Canyon follow on will have them. They'll have Gen 12, actually. It'll even be the, the next iteration. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but the, that, that's, again, that's, that's re- that was a big improvement for Intel, but they were starting from such a low place, you know, uh, so it still wouldn't be for a product like that, which is targeted at like mid range gamers. Uh, they, the, the third-party graphics is indicating not that there won't be any any integrated graphics, but there won't be anything bigger like Z or uh, you know a, a third-party. You're, you're, you're you know what's have to weird about the third-party party graphics thing? Isn't Intel supposed to have their own discrete graphics product at some that's point? That's the rumor. Well, that's that's so what you're saying. Why, because... why would they have third-party <laughs> yeah, the... if they have first-party <clears throat> in-house? They could just drop a card in there with better performance than Gen 11 because it's it's a higher power, I'm sure, with with faster clock, mm-hmm. maybe more execution. It's units. telling. It's fill in the blanks. I, I can't tell if yeah. you're if you're reiterating for effect or if you were just weren't listening when I was starting this topic. But that was the whole point: is they don't yeah. show Z graphics in this roadmap. They did not say it. Is that you think it, that would be the timing if this thing comes to light and they finally get this into the market, wherever it falls in the performance category? If they finally get this into the yeah. market, that would be a kind of product you'd see it in. But uh, but Jeremy, you were going to go off on the names here. <laughs> oh, oh my God! Like. I'm now going to have to remember Austin Beach and Chandler Bay. And this is the name. It, it's paired together. Uh, Chaco Canyon, which is, you know, going to just lead to Sonny and Cher jokes. June Canyon, uh, which will be released sometime other than June, obviously. Is it sure. Arches Canyon or Archie's Canyon? Because, you know, I want to say it wrong. Our case. It, it, <laughs> they've already <laughs> screwed up Ela, Ela Canyon. Uh, it, it's it's getting insane trying to write this out uh, to describe what the architecture is, what the architecture's name is, its base clock, its boost clock, its one core base boost, its all core boost, it, its multi core boost. I'm too 
thousand words in describing what the actual thing I'm trying to describe is. Well, the and only there's still no Tiger King Lake. Sure. The, the the good, somewhat good news is that all those ones or most of those you went through, those are the lower end, like the rugged skew, the essential. Fair. Those are going to be going into enterprise. You know, we're not really going to cover those uh, elaborately, if, if at all. Uh, we're yeah. not going to get those. No, I'm going to continue to cover the uh, Hades follow on for yes. the next several years. Hades follow on. I don't care what they call it. It's called Hades follow on. Okay. Um, and it, it, it's XX plus 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 generation. Sure. And that's another square. Oh, <laughs> gotta, gotta, we got to satisfy of. the crowd. I need to find a. I need to put a link to that bingo sheet in the show notes for convenient access. But uh, let's talk about uh, Big Navi or RDNA two. Uh, so this is uh, AMD's uh, next uh, graphics uh, architecture. We know that it's coming in the new consoles, the PlayStation Five and the uh, Xbox Series X. Uh, but there was a an event. Uh, when was that? Monday, Tuesday of this week. Uh, it was the Bank of America 2020 Securities Global Technology Conference. And mm. uh, this was uh, found out for us, the articles over at Hot Hardware. But basically, uh, the the CFO, so this was this was an, an industry thing, uh, you know, more books on the business side of things. But the CFO, AMD CFO, Devinder Kumar, um, made a, answered some questions, made a statement on this, this uh, call. And one of the things he said hinted that, well, first of all, they, they confirmed that this is going to be what they call a Halo product, which is good. I think we expected that. They need a really good high-performance product to really catch up, uh, hopefully, with NVIDIA and keep ahead of in whatever Intel is going to come out with. But the more interesting side of this is he said, and here's the quote, you know, oh, uh, there's a lot of ads going on over at Hot Hydro here. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> let me just turn that off. Uh, he said, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, one of the things on the gaming side is that there's a lot of excitement for Navi 2, or what our fans have dubbed Big Navi. This will be our first, our, this will be our first RDNA 2-based product. And if that's the case, uh, then, and he's talking about, I assume, again, it, it could be wrong because he's the CFO, maybe he's not getting the technical side of things right. But that would indicate that we're going to see a discrete card for the consumer market, RDNA 2, Big Navi, hit the market, if it's first, that means it's before the consoles. If the consoles are coming in the holiday, so October, November, I would say, hey, maybe late summer, maybe this this is coming sooner uh, rather than later for us, uh, which would be great because we're all waiting for uh, NVIDIA to finally unleash, um, you know, what they've been hiding and working on. What do you guys think? I got to agree with you. Yeah, because the, the read is good. I think that's what you're you're actually uh, saying is is probably uh, correct in there interpreting uh, that particular rumor. Uh, I don't have a lot of more to add to that one other than I hope it's actually true. They did swear it was going to be in 2020, so yeah, more than likely. Yeah. Well, and you've got NVIDIA coming pretty close. It's not that long before we're going to start seeing those 3000s drop. But one more thing, Jim, is that uh, you got to take whatever AMD is saying with a little bit of grain of salt, because a lot of things that they say or that they imply is going to happen is not actually what happens. You got to look at a few of the releases that have happened with them recently. And I, CPUs have been pretty much OK, but some of their GPU uh, um, like uh, tells have not been exactly accurate. You can look at the most recent one with the like the 5600 series where they had mm. to reclock. Uh, almost immediately before they uh, kind of released or after they sort of released, they're not sort of hitting 100% in their GPU zone. There's a so. there's a definite divide between Radeon Technology Group, RTG, which is, let's just think of it as ATI, and AMD. <laughs> and AMD, yeah. they had that one delay recently with uh, the 3950X and probably a mixture of like chips going to Epic and just the fact that it, it took longer for the seven nanometer process to mature for them to get the good bins on those chips that had to have all eight cores enabled and to hit those aggressive 4.7 gigahertz boost clocks, which is 100 megahertz higher than the 3900X. So that was the one delay there. Everything else has come out on time and been right. not, not readily available, but has been available within the first two or three months, certainly. And unlike recent Intel releases where... Currently, the products that I reviewed for the 12th or the, was it 10th gen? 
desktop Tense. are not available anywhere. They're, so nope. I think, but if you look at AMD as a whole, which of course includes Radeon Technology Group, there is some disorganization there. It seems like they they make promises that they can't deliver, or we see one thing in one roadmap which gets revised and pushed. It's kind of like Intel's desktop was, but not quite as bad. Though right. Big Navi's been this thing that has just been in the ether for what a year now. We keep waiting and waiting and waiting, and so even eighteen months, twenty. Yeah, it's been a while. I think a lot of people have put it up on a pedestal, and I think we realistically maybe need to dial that back a little bit. No, you need to knock that pedestal down. Uh, I think, and again, <laughs> I think, you know, I've don't, got, don't be shy. Yeah, I've got no I've insight into this, but I mean, th- and I think that we've all said this sort of same thing before the last couple of uh, releases of AMD GPUs. Don't. Uh, don't believe, don't try and make people believe that you're going to knock NVIDIA off of the top performing. It, it's not going to happen. I mean, I hope I'm wrong. That would be amazing. And the new Navi comes out and it just blows everything out of the water. And it's brilliant. <coughs> I like GPUs I can afford. <laughs> yeah. I would love a 2080 Ti. Uh, in the States, it's close to 12. In Canada, it's significantly higher. Right now, vast majority of the world has sort of uh, seen a, a, a not a good year financially. So yeah, okay, you and Nvidia drops a 3080 Ti or God only really knows what they're going to call the things nowadays, uh, and charges like they did for the previous generation, you know, a grand to fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, I wish I could get it. I'm not even looking at it apart from yeah, that's really spiffy. If AMD can target the we're pretty good, but when you're looking at uh, frames to dollars, we're unquestionably the king. It would actually make me a lot happier. Like that That's sort of the big Navi I want to see, is something that is going to be a significant jump from their previous generation, NVIDIA's current generation, but at a price that, we, that you can literally go out and buy. And you know, as we've mentioned, that you can actually find... Would be nice. Yeah, it's undoubtable that their approach is to be the affordability portion of the market. You know, but they to like be... to pretend that they're going to be the best of the best. That's well, probably they, they not. They had that actually... attitude when Raja was still there. Is he Vega, wanted... yeah. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. And but he's gone. Obviously, he works at Intel now. And I, I don't know. I I feel like just I went to the technology the day last year at E three. And the the messaging when we were being in like informed, like a room full of tech press, some of whom are far more technically literate than others, and a lot of whom are more technically literate about GPU architecture than me. They're trying to explain to this room how because they changed the topology of the graphic that they used to explain what RDNA architecture was, if you actually were to turn things around and actually order them the same way as this, the graphics core next architecture was laid out, they were identical. And they said, okay, yes, top, from a topology standpoint, there are a lot of similarities, which they immediately smoothed over. They had talking points. They had been rehearsing how to explain to the press, RDNA is totally new. It's a new architecture. It's not just Graphics Core Next again, even though certain product identifiers had led like data miners to that conclusion at, at early stages. And originally it was thought in like 2018 leading into 2019 that it was going to be like the last Graphics Core Next. And then the next architecture would come out. And it seems to be something of a hybrid. It, it almost looks like they did deliver the new architecture, but it's... It's like a, a substantially beefed up front end to feed a lot more data through what is essentially the same architecture. And I, again, I'm not an expert. I just remember how they they made such a big deal out of how they boosted the front end and gave the GPU a lot more work to do. And they were able to do this because of the die shrink down to seven nanometer and the fact that they were able to uh, basically manage the amount of wattage that it took to make this happen because of the die shrink, but you didn't actually have any lower power draw from the die shrink. It's just kind of the same thing that happened with Radeon 7. Radeon 7 was a supercharged Vega 64. And it wasn't even the full 64 compute units enabled. It was only 60, because it was a modified MI60 uh, 
uh, enterprise card. So like a inferencing uh, AI card. But they had carefully binned it. They got it to higher clocks, higher peak clocks, and they put a different cooler on it and they marketed it as a gaming card. It was a short-lived product, but they were trying to have something that could compete with NVIDIA at the high end. And they matched NVIDIA's pricing at six ninety nine, dollars and because it could trade blows with the RTX 2080. And of course, NVIDIA's response to this was to release the 2080 Super, which made the Vega at six ninety nine totally irrelevant. We saw the Vega, <laughs> the Radeon 7 drop by a hundred dollars we ended up seeing it drop by like 170 dollars i was seeing him for 539 and then they just kind of quietly end of life it so well they were losing money at their msrp so oh, yeah the, the yeah. 16 gigabytes of hbm and of oh, course it's now absolutely. in a second life as a as a, a creative like workstation card and it's they've got the big it's a great oh, card brilliant. for that yeah yeah, yeah. And, and it's worth the big premium if that's what you need especially if you're not writing the check for that product. Like if your business is buying it, who cares if it's $1,700, I guess, but uh, it's, well, that's a different the market. Was, yeah. The Radeon <laughs> seven was a steal. You, you just got to have for, it. Or uh, <laughs> like rendering, like open GL, open CL stuff. But mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. they, what do they have? Like they have the 5,700 and the 5,700 XT. So you're hitting up to like the $400, $450 price level. And then you had the Radeon 7 that was discontinued. That was like, like a year ago now. That was last summer they discontinued that. So we're still waiting. But it was a waiting. good card. It was okay. It was fine. It still it yeah. drew 300 watts from the wall to do... Well, I mean, yeah. 20% better than the Vega 64 did. Just don't use this month's Corsair power supply. You're going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the uh, question is, can we see what they do with with Navi, with all this time to continue to develop, refine, and bring it to that my, higher power level. incredibly long-winded ramble that I, I don't even know where I was going with that. What I'm trying to say is they couldn't do it with existing architecture. They had to wait until they had the yes. fully baked, brand new from the ground up architecture RDNA 2, which may or may not be significantly different from RDNA from a architectural standpoint. And mm -hmm. there may or may not have still been the CU limit that we have with Graphics Core Next. You could only go up to 64 CUs with yeah. that architecture. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we had products coming out with fewer and fewer CUs. We had the Radeon 7 come out with only 60 instead of 64. Then we had the 5700 series come out. And I think the 5700 XT has 40. I'm not totally wrong about that. I can't remember. It's like 40 and 32. Somewhere in there. So we were waiting for that. What was it going to be? Was it going to be another 64 CU part? Because that's literally going to be, you know, like following in the footsteps of the Vega 64. Where's the part with 128 CUs? Where's the monster, huge NVIDIA killer part where they can take advantage of the 7 nanometer uh, process node and just throw a whole bunch of streaming processors at the problem and take the crown? And I don't think they could do that from an architectural standpoint. Or maybe it was a power issue because as we've seen, they weren't getting huge improvements in efficiency from the drop to seven nanometer because they had to make a choice. They can take this architecture or a new version of the architecture down to a lower process node and increase clocks and therefore meet the same power limit. Or we can take it down and we can have the same performance with lower power. It's the same thing that Intel was dealing with with 10 nanometer, their transition there, which was go down to 10 nanometer. Yeah, it's lower power, but it's also lower performance. AMD using TSMC's seven nanometer technology, they can, they apparently can just go crazy with voltage and power and have a seven nanometer GPU that pulls like 200 plus watts and it's fine and it works. It's 100 plus degrees under load, but it works. And I'm just curious as to maybe some roadblocks they hit because it's not like every card they're ever going to sell is going to go to an enthusiast. They had to explain to a room of media that we sell cards to places like Dell. And there's a reason we're still using yeah. a blower cooler, even though everybody in the room was groaning. It's a blower <laughs> again. It was like, look, we understand. And there are going to be enthusiast cards for you. They're going to be third party cooler designs for you. But that's what third party are coolers this. are for. Right. We're releasing like, this to the lowest common denominator the system integrator who has a tiny case with bad airflow and a little aluminum CPU cooler 
and they can't have all this hot air inside the case or they have to beef up the CPU cooling and they have to change the airflow and they have to add more case fans and all of that stuff adds to the cost of a What about that stupid Dell shroud? That Dell shroud. They still use you know it. What I'm talking about? They still yeah. use it. it. Was in the 3020s. Well, well this so, this uh, went way off where I was hoping it would go. I mean, that's a good conversation, but I was, we're, sorry. we're so far out. Uh, all I heard was something oh, about... I was going to make it worse, Jim. Oh, all right, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that we can be fairly reassured, I think, that it's not going to be ridiculously power-hungry. At least the architecture itself. Yes, it could be made power-hungry, but it probably won't mm-hmm. be because mm-hmm. it's in Sony and Nintendo's next-generation consoles. These generally tend to have a plastic shroud and body. So if it gets too hot, that's not going to be a good thing. So the architecture itself is probably not going to be inherently uh, power hungry and produce a, a sh- an amazing amount of heat. Then again, you know, when you look at the higher end cards, it could well be. And the other thing that, you know, I'm sort of saving as, or is it Nintendo? It's Sony and yeah, PlayStation 5 is... Well, it's Sony be. with PlayStation and Microsoft with Xbox Series Microsoft, X. yeah. Can you tell I play a lot of console games? Uh, and is in, like, none. I've got an all-in-one Pac-Man that, from an old and NES, and that's it. But, <laughs> you know, these are not going to be power-hungry systems. They, they simply can't be because the, the, the consumers that they're going for won't put up with it. What do you mean I have to have an external sort of power supply? I, Power brick is stretching it just a little bit, but we'll accept that. And the other thing is that they're going to get so much experience with this build. Like they're not just putting out carts, and that that is going to be one thing that we may see uh, as we did when the the original uh, batch of these came out, however many years ago it was, where Nvidia is just putting out their carts, and that's it. And AMD is powering all of the current console generations and trying to you know increase the 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 consumer enthusiast discrete cards that we're picking up so there is hope that it's not going to be anywhere near as power hungry because i can't imagine uh the console companies picking something up that would be i you know that would add to the cost of running their console that would make their console less as attractive than any others uh that are out there or less attractive than upgrading from your previous version. So, you know, there is that hope. At least I think there is that it's, it's going to be a nice jump in generation. How big, I don't know though. Your argument says that backing your way into heat death on a console uh, basically says that nobody likes the red ring of death. And I got, it's a strange stance to take, but yeah, I, uh, no, you're you make sense if you kind of like back your way into it saying like they're going to thermally manage this because they've learned something well i mean microsoft has long learned that lesson they've made the first xbox one a tank and then with this the xbox uh one x they did the vapor cooling custom thing and then with this exactly. new one there it's i mean i because we're only going off what they've released but phil spencer has been you know, we're talking up the, the custom cooling arrangement. Uh, so we haven't seen this. We haven't seen anything on the PlayStation design, at least I, now that I've seen. I don't think they've released well, that. You yet. no longer have spinning media to cover the sound of your fan. You know what right. I'm saying? Well, yeah. The, the not, not, yeah. Sony was not as good thermally this generation. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it could be. But also, there's a difference between a product tuned for mass market console versus a product going into a Halo triple slot custom enthusiast discrete card so yeah it's 250 megahertz i don't know uh okay (laughs) well all i will say is let's keep expectations in check i don't want a repeat of the vega meltdown if we all remember that when when ryan and um alan and all those guys were still here they were still you know running the site and the vega launch and i was just the lowly video guy in the corner but they were they were live benchmarking vega 64 it was the air cooled and the water cooled, remember? And and people were all excited because Raja had told everyone and everyone wanted, they so desperately wanted AMD to compete with NVIDIA. And uh, it just, those initial benchmarks started coming out and people just lost it. It was chaos. Yeah, we also wanted that mini card and that never came out either. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You could get well, a 56 a... in that, in that one, in that one yeah. kind of mm-hmm. ITX form factor. You could. 
I inherited all that stuff. I have the Nano. That's a beautiful oh, piece that's, of that's, it. that's the one. The Nano that's is a nice one. little thing. If you can cool that bugger, it's actually pretty good. Yeah, just point some extra fans at it. It's fine. I'm just okay. I'm looking at specs. I was just I we beat this to death, but the 5700 XT is 40 compute units. They had to lower they had to to meet a target obviously a 225 watt TDP and it's only got 40 compute units. So tell me how that architecture is going to support something with more than 64 and be a killer card and not be like a 400 watt card. So it's there's no way they could do it this generation. Lisa will personally bless every card <laughs> and you will we will taking them this long to bin them. <laughs> She did sign some 50, uh, 5700 XTs. That's yeah, there's, a, there's an anniversary edition. Uh, yep, or whatever they're called. Yeah, those are nice looking. They have her. They were carrying them around it. this lounge at E3 and letting people hold them and do little photo ops with them. So I'm like, would you uh, like to hold the card? I'm like, sure. Like, yeah, okay. I handed it back. Okay, but Sebastian, yeah. I want you to very quickly and succinctly tell me about this next story. We're getting an <laughs> official. Get one. When have I ever been efficient about anything? Oh, it's very quick. Not, not. Uh, last year, we heard that Lenovo was doing uh, Ubuntu Linux certification for their ThinkPad P series. It's a, a portable workstation and laptops. This year, they're they're kind of taking it to the next level. It's the ThinkStation workstations and the full ThinkPad P series lineup. So every model, built to order, whatever you want to do configuration wise, you can get either Ubuntu Linux or uh, Red Hat. They have, uh, they're saying end-to-end -end support for Linux this time. So it's security patches, uh, updates, uh, firmware, BIOS optimizations, etc. So they're actually upstream device drivers directly to the Linux kernel is what they're, they're promising. So it, it's, they're getting a lot more serious about it. This is something that they say a lot of, you know, there's, it's not just this small kind of niche desktop user thing. There are professions that make use of Linux and it, it makes sense to offer this on a professional device. So I'm, it's always good to see it as an option. I hope it also, you get that like slight savings too. I mean, these are not inexpensive laptops. That's the thing. The P series is link pad, but you know, windows isn't free for some reason, even though it's really a data collection vehicle at this point. So you might save like 50 bucks, a hundred bucks off the costs by having an Ubuntu design. So I, I know that other companies have done this in the past, and obviously, like I said, Lenovo did this before, but it was like pick and choose certain models might offer it. Or like when Dell would do it, it was like the Ubuntu version of one of their laptops. You had to go like find the URL to even get to the product page because it wasn't on the main product page. So this is going to make it a lot more accessible to order a machine, spec it out however you want, choose the operating system that you want, and then they're they're pledging full support. So even if you're not like especially knowledgeable and know like like go through the forums and find help and they're they're gonna make it a little bit easier to uh, transition to Linux if you are not already using it. I hope. Yeah, it's just going forward to make sure that they stay with the updates. That's uh, just a question. And uh I was gonna be offended until you mentioned Red Hat. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh no, that was the other thing. I mean they they've got yeah, I saw that, it. Was, that was a big deal. And look, there's a little graphic yep. in there that shows Red Hat superimposed over a monitor. It's, you know. Yep. Trailing Edge is still is also important. Well, it is important. They've partnered it is with the Fedora project to offer a pilot program oh, with a preloaded okay. Fedora image on their ThinkPad P53 and P1 Gen 2 systems, providing well, the latest like LTE. Pure open source platform no, for this community based no. distribution. I like my Linux equivalent to like the ability of dump trucks, which is carry a large load and not be very exciting. It, that is actually it exactly. That's, that's CentOS. CentOS. Okay, I don't uh, like to shout a lot of money for it either. My own install, <laughs> well, but I'm carefully supporting it. Jim, Jim, his head's going to explode now. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. Okay. So our last you're, story, real quick, because because we mentioned it last week, Windows 10, 2004, 20H1, whatever there was another code name for it, whatever you want to call it, the most recent version of Windows. It did. They launched it. They said they launched it. There was a press release and a website and nice graphics of a woman using a Windows system in her sun porch, and it was great. But Aww. then everyone went out to go get it, and nobody can get it. Basically, you'll see a screen like that, and it'll say, "Hey, it, it's there," but you can't have it yet because you're not a you know your system, your configuration is not approved. Now, not everyone's seeing that screen. Section um, does not approve. Yeah, um, 
<laughs> it's uh, uh, not everyone's seeing that. Some like I got one of like one of my VMs, and they're all configured the same. So I don't I don't know why only one, but one of them upgraded, and the others wouldn't take it. In some cases, you're not even seeing that notice about 2004. You just don't see it. It just says you're up to date, even if you're on 1909. Uh, there's a list of issues that are open. People are speculating that these issues and these configurations, which include a number of Microsoft's first-party systems like Surface Laptop and Surface Pro, there's 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 configuration issues, and so they're holding it back. But they're not clear because they didn't. None, none of this happened. Like these weren't posted until 2004 launched. Like this wasn't part of the very lengthy testing phase it was this was the i think since the launch of windows 10 this this build was in testing for longer than any other and none of this stuff came up so uh if you haven't gotten it yet it's not just you and uh if you do want to force it if you're willing to you know ignore these uh security uh potential security consequences or, or compatibility consequences you can get the uh the upgrade tool and you know that's the you know, the media installation creation tool which allows you instead of creating media to also just directly install and that will work. I did test that on a couple of systems. It seems to work. So, uh, but it may However, your side panel ready. may fly off and break your Dark Rock Pro. That's a totally separate issue. Well, Microsoft's got Are a lot sure? of the way of that. I'm sure That's because Sebastian wouldn't touch this with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> he is all about version integrity and maintaining consistency. He would not upgrade. Well, for now. No, there's no, no way. There's no way yeah. I would try to. Because I, I thought about downloading the image and then starting CPU testing on that. No. My 1909, uh, with whatever that last update was, and I'm, I'm just that's fine for now. And of course, then it will become well, they've improved the AMD CPU scheduler. So, okay, that's something that I would hope that AMD's platform drivers, since I use AMD Power Profiles like the Ryzen Balance and Ryzen High, high Performance, would already have taken care of, but maybe not. But yeah, I'm sure that'll be a thing. Going forward, hey, maybe the new version has even better uh, support for processors with 64 or more cores. That well, was something they, they had to be on they it. want you to upgrade a workstation, don't they, for that? Or is that multiprocessor? I don't know. Then, then they came out like that, that was, yeah, like yeah. around February 16, they came out and said, I don't know, it works. You don't, you can just use Pro. You don't need Enterprise. And you just have to be on this build or higher. And because of course, thirty nine ninety went out, and like the select few who got one to test, it's like doesn't even have better performance necessarily under Windows. Of course, it's yeah. a different deal with Linux. But. And if you're interested in that kind of stuff, go check out Level One Techs on YouTube. Wendell over there did a lot of coverage oh, yeah. on yeah. Uh, Windows scheduling on the thirty nine ninety, and he's just a big uh, Threadripper and Linux nerd in general. So uh, good stuff. I can't wait till Microsoft implements this uh, license per core. That they've been <laughs> yes. on about yeah, for we, a talk, while. we talked about that uh, a while ago. It's the way the world's going. When when the when the chip makers are putting too many cores in your customers' hands, you got to do something to recoup that revenue. You can't rely on sockets yeah. anymore. Yeah, hey, if I disable twenty of them cores with a screwdriver, they don't count anymore, do they? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know what? It doesn't matter. Okay. Keep throwing so cores at it. Pay me. Pay let's, me. Let's get to the picks of the week. Jeremy, you're up first. Oh, good God, am I? Uh, yeah, so th this one I stumbled upon on Physics World, and it just amused the hell out of me because, uh, as some engineering students have found out, wearing uh, LMD-embedded clothing with a battery pack doesn't work out too well for you, and I'd really not try it this year. But uh, they've uh, done some development, and it's literally a wearable supercapacitor. So our Supercap t-shirts are now going to have to be made of this. Uh, but it, it's, it's using the motion to start, uh, to create the electrical charge and it's actually storing the charge in your sweat. Wow. Now this sounds a little bit gross, but well, honestly, you, you, I, and everyone else on the planet that doesn't have a serious medical condition sweats. And so what they managed was with, uh, 20 pico liters of sweat they were able to generate 10 milliwatts of power, which will do your average uh, LED strip. And I think this is just bloody freaking amusing. The other thing they did was uh, to use it as a salinity sensor. So for professional athletes, it was actually checking the salinity of your sweat because, you know, if it starts to drop, you're going to start building up lactic acid. It's going to be a very bad thing. Your marathon is going to go horribly. So it's, really interesting and the fun thing is it's a polymer 
So, you know, it's, it's not like, uh, you're trying to weave metallic thread into a cloth or anything. You just, you know, put a polymer cording on your average fabric and it's perfectly happy. You're not going to be able to quite buy it yet, but when you do, I mean, even the prototype was quite happy after they managed 4,000 cycles. It was still perfect. And yes, they washed it. Uh, so, you know, keep an eye out for this sort of project. Uh, it's, uh, out of the university of Glasgow, uh, because I mean, Scotland is just amazing. They don't just make scotch. They make other good things. So keep an eye out of it, out for it. This could be a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to the day when our super cap t-shirt glows in and of its own power. I could have used that last week when it was 94. You degrees could have now. lit in the entire, you could have kept, oh. uh, to break I, the power going. Exactly. Can I see how much like 300 picoliters of sweat is like in the, in a Mason jar? Can I, can I see that? Not I'm easily just a visual. Just uh, it'd be wondering. like a bead on the bottom. Mm. Oh, thank God. Not much. I thought it would be gross. I thought it'd be gross. No, but it's not. All Jim right. could have powered a city. Uh, well, well, I'll put it this way. Let's uh, all be thankful that we do not have smell of vision because <laughs> whole oh boy. <laughs> And you're locked in a room, you get used to it. And then when you leave the room, it, yeah. Anyway, uh, Brett, your pick. Yeah. Hey, do you remember when like, like 300 gig used to be a lot for your server or stuff like that? And, you know, you used to be able to slam that into your server and like carry on and all that. This is a SCSI disc and all, you know, Ooh. for old tech, for old tech day, you know, it's a check out that logo on the end there. I think it. Yep. Can you see the little S's? Uh, uh, maybe. Other side. This side. Yep. Sun Microsystems. Mm -hmm. You know, I like money, so I like to save a little money every now and then. So I figured saving 150 bucks on buying like uh, a 12 terabyte drive might be a good deal. So 270 bucks on a 12 terabyte Toshiba X300. This is not uh, dedicated towards like RAID or um, <clears throat> server, but it does suffice with, I think, like a 600,000 MTBF, and that's mean time between failure rate. 600,000 hours means you could probably put it in your RAID and, and feel good about yourself, um, especially you, since you could buy almost two of these for the cost of what one normally costs you. I mean, literally, I went and looked this up on uh, on Newegg, this exact disc, and it's $149 more. So this is an outstanding deal at this uh, data rate, uh, 12 terabytes at $270. Um, basically, the more you buy, the more you save on this one. So yeah, go ahead and do that. And, you know, check that off on the uh, next version of the uh, bingo card. As All I right. said it. You said it. That's over at, at uh, OWC, uh, Otherworld Computing, maxsales.com, uh, where you get that deal. Yep. All right, uh, Sebastian, and it what comes you with got the shingles vaccine, right? It is not necessarily SMR, 12 terabytes. So, you know, feel free to go ahead and buy and right away. Uh, my pick, I saw, oh, it's back down to its $79.99 price tag. That's good. It was $90 earlier. It's a vacuum cleaner. It's the VacMaster Professional. It's part of their Beast series. This is a it large. Sounds a moist gallon. theme tonight. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, you know what? This has the suction that you need at the price you can afford. And this is a a very very good shop vac style vacuum, in my opinion. I was very impressed by the kit that it comes with, and one of the big deals about this. And I don't know if you've ever had this issue before, but sometimes there's a bit of a a girth problem with some of these vacuum cleaners. Yeah, they have the horsepower. They might even have the capacity, but then they have like a one and a quarter inch hose and you start to vacuum with it and it immediately becomes plugged with something. So this has the big two and a half inch hose that's diameter. And uh, you can just, you can suck up a lot of stuff with this thing. So without it, without clogs. And it's actually remarkably quiet. It comes with a little sort of muffler thing that goes on the back. I've never seen this before, but it, uh, it works reasonably well. And it's 79 bucks. For so it sucks. Was, 
It it sucks. It it sucks, it sucks hard. And but it's relatively quiet. Was was there a specific oh. incident that uh, required you to think of this? Uh, just cleaning out duct work. Okay. Uh, I traditionally had 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 people out to the house to clean out my duct work every couple of years. So you didn't have a mixed media situation. incident? No, no, no. This was being incredibly frustrated with the fact that because I have dogs and I would put the hose of my shop vac down into the cold air return and start to go down the the HVAC and it would just stop and the vacuum cleaner would start screaming and my God's plugged. So I'd pull it out. There's this pile of dog hair and I have to like shake out the hose and like use tools, pull stuff out with a with like a pliers and, a and then stick. You, you, start, you, you start over take again. the stick and you insert it into the hole. Yeah. But I didn't have a long enough stick. Or a marble. Well, that's your problem. You know, yeah, yeah. Some of the these jokes just marbles. Themselves. Get out with the marble. What happens? Do you have any old marbles? I, I just can't. It's too easy. Really? That's the VacMaster professional <laughs> over at Amazon. We'll have a link there. And because people are talking about the, uh, they're mentioning Jeremy's uh, 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 reference to the SMR controversy that we talked about a few weeks ago, I did see in my feed, I haven't had a chance to watch the whole thing today, uh, so I don't know what his conclusion is. But um, Patrick Kennedy over at Serve the Home just re- re- recently released a video on YouTube compare- benchmarking and, and looking at uh, like objective comparisons between uh, shingled and conventional uh, Guess drives. which one won. Oh, I, I, I'm sure the, I, I know the answer, but uh, check that out. We'll have a little, we'll, if I can remember, I'll put a link to that video over there as well. Uh, Patrick does great stuff I, over at my, Serve the Home. My pick is, is Raid Rebuild Safe. Okay. Go ahead and do it. All right. And then finally, my pick is uh, something that's been out for a couple weeks, but I just got a chance to watch it um, just uh, yesterday. And this is a video, it's a YouTube video over uh, at Red Letter Media. If you're not familiar, they're a longstanding um, uh, channel. They do basically comedy style uh, media reviews, uh, films and TV shows. And it's, 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 it's a very simple thing. You know, these, these guys, they're all longtime friends. They sit around and they, they review movies, but they also do uh, certain characters. And there's a character called Mr. Plinkett. Uh, which is sort of like a, he, he kind of talks with like a slur and he's, and he's like, he's half drunk. Uh, but he also, while talking like that, makes really good points. And so there's a series of reviews they've done and they did one on the whole Star Trek Picard series, the new one that uh, came out earlier this year on CBS All Access. And uh, it really hits, I mean, I think that it's a 90 minute review. It's excellently done. It hits all the point because I, I just I feel I as a longtime Star Trek fan and I know Sebastian is a Star Trek fan too big big one um, something's wrong something is is wrong at uh, CBS something is wrong with Alex Kurtzman that talentless piece of garbage who they keep giving control of Star Trek to uh, I was going to say what's wrong with him we've already established what he is uh, I get it. Mm-hmm. but it's it, and and I I didn't I don't really like a lot of the way they handled Discovery and I had hope for this but it turned out I just felt it wasn't all terrible it's probably objectively better than Discovery so so far but it still wasn't great and I don't want to spoil this for you but he put feelings I couldn't like put to words or understand or appreciate he put them in this review uh, into into words and the the ending is uh, really touching if you're a longtime Star Trek fan uh, but also depressing. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's like it, he reminds us of why we like Star Trek and and can put into words uh, why this is so this all this new stuff feels so wrong. Um, so it sounds like you're out. talking about episode one. Like this is the same kind of pain that Star Wars fans went through after years and years of nothing. And then yep. it's coming back. My beloved characters are coming back. <sighs> it's like, but no, and then we had to wade through all the new stuff. Yeah. So. There's a lot of common uh, grievances that long. Yeah, I was saying that about Star uh, Wars Battlestar Galactica. Fans. Oh, really? You didn't like the reboot? God, no. Oh, okay. There's nothing like what I remembered as a kid in the 70s. Well, because it was so campy back then. <laughs> exactly. Oh, all right. It was okay. brilliant. There was the oh, this, yeah, the it's star, all a mystery. No, it is. You're all fucking silent. Like it's, it's not a mystery. Man, we knew it. Woman, everybody's a Cylon, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, teach their own, I guess. You're going um, to cut all this, aren't you? Oh. Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, but uh, thanks. Uh, we're we're going to wrap the show, the uh, the official show up here. Uh, we're we're going to continue with our, our little after show for a bit. That's another benefit if you watch live, uh, or if you're a Patreon member, we, you get access to the full uncut streams. You don't get the sidebar and all that, but you get to see all the mistakes and embarrassment 
and all the the discussion before and after the official show. So be sure to and check power that out. outages and po- you know, right, exactly. Jim crying, yeah, yep, it's the lot, crying, a, the tears, real tears. There's a lot of sobbing. Um, it's it gets dark, but yeah, we're glad you could be here with us. Um, you know, a lot of people are. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. We're all kinds of. We were coming off this quarantine. There's a lot of issues all over the world for all different kinds of reasons. Uh, all I want to say is, you know, we care about you. We wish everyone the best. Please be well to each other. Be well to yourselves. Um, just, uh, you know, exercise empathy and remember, we all have to live on this planet. So let's find a way to work with each other and uh, and just take care of each other. And uh, I'm not trying to make a political statement here. Um, no, I'm just trying to say that's not let's political. Take care of each other. And, uh, and we wish you the best and we hope to see you back next week. So thanks everyone. Take care.